Okay, so um, warm welcome to our uh, session on hardware hacking, which sounds pretty fanciful, and it's a good place to be. And this is, in a way, what this talk will be about, in a specific flavor, namely that of quantum simulation and computing as a new way of computing beyond supercomputers. Now, and the story goes somehow like that. In 1965, Gordon Moore, a co-founder of Intel, looked at the development of computing until that time, starting with the famous SUSE Z3 machine that was built in dark times in, in Berlin over the ENIAC machine and so on, to realize that the progress in building hardware was so fast that the number of transistors in integrated circuits or elementary building blocks for earlier machines would approximately double every two years, or rather every 18 months. And like challenging as this may sound, this um, turned out to be a remarkably accurate description, in fact, prediction until today. If you look at the most fanciful chips at a given time, look at the transistor count as a function of time in a logarithmic plot, you see that these dudes look pretty much, sit pretty much just on a straight line like this. So that reflects smarter and smarter uh, design architectures in earlier times, then better and better automated design later, better lithographic, lithographic techniques, and ultimately smaller and smaller minimum feature sizes that uh, made this possible. And taking this development for a moment for granted, one realizes that not too long in the future, this would mean that the minimum feature sizes of computers would be down to those of single atoms. And, well, that would be not so remarkable. Was it not that at that scale, nature functions very differently? We are in a realm of a very different physics, namely that of quantum mechanics. Picking up on the theme, that Nicola so nicely introduced a couple of minutes ago. So we are in the realm of quantum mechanics. This is, what is this? This is a physical theory, just like Newtonian mechanics that would like, predict, say, that apples fall down if you let them go in a gravitational field. It's just like that, a physical theory. It governs nature at the very small scale, like that of atoms, molecules, light quanta, and so on. But then, since our things, materials, you, me, things are made from macroscopic particles, ultimately, it's the theory of, of nature. It's the best theory we have today. It was developed in a rush of activity in, the, in a few years in the 1920s by a handful of protagonists, which is actually quite remarkable in its own right, that they came up with such a delicate, deep, and profound theory in such short amount of time without the preprint server, the internet, not even Twitter was around at that time, and they did make it afterwards. So it's a long and winding story how they met in trains and scribbled stuff on, 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 on like sheets of paper to, to make it all happen in a, in a short amount of time. Now, it's the fundamental theory of nature, and as such, it's also the basis of semiconductors, material science, lasers. It seems fair to say that pretty much any high-tech endeavor is in one way or the other related to quantum mechanics, at least in the sense that one has to know the theory to see the functioning of this principle, this device, this um, machine. It has enormous predictive power. So this number here shows not only an important quantity in the theory as a theoretical prediction. That's my realm. I'm a uh, dry swimmer, so to say. I'm a theorist. But also the um, results of experimental data of the same kind. And all these digits are the same, which kind of highlights the predictive power of the theory. Now, this is great and interesting in its own right. But for our purposes for this theme between me and you and lunch, uh, is that this theory is different. It's different from classical mechanics, and for that matter, from our everyday intuition. In fact, it's 
radically different. And we come to that. Good, first thing, and I'm not assuming that you were in Nicola's beautiful talk. There's some redundancy, but never underestimate the charm of learning what you already know. So, quantum mechanics is random, or has an element of randomness. If you make a measurement like this, you could say perform a measurement on a single particle that exhibits a spin of some sort, you let the particle fly and then you make a measurement and you would get an outcome. Let's do an experiment like zero, one, one, zero, one. It, it clicks, but it's random. The theory is utterly silent about specific outcomes. It only says with what probability something would happen. Okay, that's the feature of the theory. It's a bit awkward after all. It's never saying what's going to happen, but it's what is likely going to happen. But, well, let's get over it. I mean, it's not that awkward after all. We are used to randomness in, in many realms and, 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 and flavors. Like, once I met the same friend twice in New York City, I thought, whoa, what a random event. How, how, how awkward is that? Or say roulette. I mean, that's kind of the epicenter of randomness. I mean, it's the very point of playing roulette that it's pretty much random what comes out. That's what the, 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 the fate of the, of the bank is, why, why they win, because it's, it, it's random. But if you think about it, it's not really random in the sense that there is an explanation that could be held responsible for the type of randomness encountered. Say, I could have kept contact with a friend in New York City. I could have written a Facebook message saying, hi, I'm in New York City, can we meet? And then this randomness would have evaporated because we would have just met. Or roulette. Sure, it's random, but if we knew exactly the speed at which the ball falls in, the velocity of the wheel turning, maybe the wind in the room, and all these parameters, we could, in principle, by the laws of physics, predict where the ball would end. And, um, well, uh, to my knowledge, one of the reasons why mobile phones are not allowed in casinos, except from them being extremely annoying in that context, is that people had been filming uh, roulette tables in the past and had supercomputers in the background making computations that at least could give a bias to the distribution at the end to ultimately rob the bank and casinos do not like this very much. So there's bouncers coming in say, hey, excuse me. Um, so I'm saying that it's apparently random but there's a mechanism that could be held responsible for it, and that's the kind of randomness we, what we always encounter. Say, sure, I mean, there must be some explanation of a sort. It's not very, not very surprising. There's always a reason why things are random. There's always an explanation. However, in quantum mechanics, this is not the case. In quantum mechanics, it is that you go into a lab, or somebody else goes into a lab, for that matter, performs a measurement and the particle is in a way deciding in this very moment what outcome it will take. It's like absolute randomness. There's no mechanism that can be, can be held responsible for that type of randomness. So there's no substructure that could be held responsible as a kind of statistical effect after all that would determine what comes out later. And you would say, well, I mean, how would I know? I mean, maybe I could assume that this, these parameters are ultimately not observable. It's like saying, oh, there are no pink elephants that are invisible, but if they're invisible, fine. I mean, they exist, they don't exist. That's a metaphysical question. But it's not. You can actually rule out the existence of quantities that predetermine the outcomes at later times with a very delicate and, and deep argument. It's, I think, one of the deepest arguments I'm aware of of the last century that we can rule out the existence of something which you can assume to be unobservable. It's kind of a cute argument. And the mathematics behind this is going back to an argument by uh, John Bell, a, a genius in his own right who happened to have the unfortunate fate of dying before winning the Nobel Prize, um, who formulated, in addition to uh, in important contributions to high energy physics, the Bell inequality that ultimately capture type of correlations you can encounter given the extremely reasonable assumption that there could be a mechanism held responsible and physics and empirics violates these conditions in favor of absolute randomness and against there being an explanation behind it. So randomness is absolute in quantum physics. Then uncertainty. Uh, so if you make a measurement in physics, in quantum physics, you will necessarily change the state of this quantum system. It's like measuring the length of a table. 
you measure it, and then once you do it, you measure it, then the table looks like this. Have you seen it? It's like, it's a bit shorter, right? Oh, I mean, you can do a, a little bit of a measurement and disturb very little. You can do a heavy measurement and disturb very much, but there's no way you can learn about a quantum state without disturbing the system at all. There's a fundamental argument. In fact, it's much related mathematically to the previous argument that I just mentioned um, some time, uh, just a minute ago. Maybe the weirdest of all is the superposition principle, or at least in conjunction with the so-called tensor product for the experts in the room, but I realize that there's many experts in the room. <laughs> Even, uh, 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 never mind. Um, it is that, well, I mean, in quantum mechanics, things can be in states at the same time. It's like, think of the familiar bit that we love and cherish. Bits can be in zero or one, or maybe in the straight line segment if you mix around having zero or one with some probability. Yet in quantum mechanics, you have the situation as if you were in zero and one at the same time. You can be in arbitrary superpositions of zero and one at once. Right? This is a bit strange. I mean, if you think of the advice of using both exits at the same time and leaving the parking structure, that may seem a bit odd as advice when doing that. I advise you not to do it because I will predict what's going to happen. Uh, but this is very common with, in quantum physics. So with these dudes here, you will have it that they can be all over the place with single atoms. They may be often in many states at the same time. This is very common. Systems can be in many states at once. So here for the experts, the state space, the configuration space in which our quantum systems live, it's, there's a kind of a convex structure that there is, uh, that states are positive operators that are unit trace over a complex vector space with lots of complex phases over a configuration space that's c2 to the power of n, which means that the dimension of this guy is 2 to the power of n dimensional, which means that for a material like this guy here, would be have a Hilbert space of like uh, 10, 2 to the power of 10 to the power of 24 or so. I mean, this is an amazing number. It's a very large configuration space that you have in, um, quantum, uh, in quantum mechanics. Now the point, so much for the introduction. The point of quantum technologies is to make use of quantum effects but not in the way mentioned earlier in the sense that you go into the study room and learn about semiconductor physics, which you can only do if you have deeply understood quantum physics or so, but do make use of quantum effects on the level of single quantum systems, like single atoms held by tweezers, ions in traps, single photons, like single quantum systems that can be manipulated now with very large levels of accuracy. To think of new technologies in communication, sensing, computation, and simulation. This is kind of the point of this idea of quantum technologies. And we will have a look at three examples of this type. The first one will be a bit shorter, given that Nicola has already dedicated his entire talk to that, but I mean, I'm not assuming it's the same crowd, so I, I will briefly go over this, um, this, this again. Okay, so key distribution, secure, communication between two parties. It's easy to see that you can communicate between two parties if these two parties share the same key, the same bit string. Because take the bit string, add your message to it, and then again add your message model two at the end of it. If this key is shared and nobody else has that key, it's easy to see that there's no way to learn about the secret message in, in, in any uh, conceivable uh, fashion. So at the heart of the matter is the question, well, how do you get a key established in the first place? And there's th three common versions of that that um, one can reasonably think of. The first one is the one used when you use WhatsApp, your internet banking, HTTPS, and the, the common uh, encryption scheme, which are public key um, ideas like derivatives of RSA or James um, Ellis version of, of, of the same theme, which is a very delicate and very clever idea um, of, a, of a setting where there's a kind of uh, a pair of keys generated in a certain way, the security of which 
in a scheme that's practically secure is based on the fact that there are one-way problems in mathematics that are harder in one direction than in the other. Think of multiplying numbers. You, everybody learns that in school it's very easy to multiply like 3 times 5. I can do this in my head. It's 15. Whereas if I take a large number that's a product of uh, primes, like 15, there's no way I can get the factors. Well, if it's a small number, I can, but this is actually a hard problem. It's an NP problem, which means that the best algorithm doing it would have an exponential runtime, exponential in the length of the input, whereas there's a witness, meaning you can check the correctness in polynomial time, which just means here you can take the numbers, you can multiply it and check whether you get the right number and check the correctness of this. That's kind of a one-way problem where, which is easy in one direction and not so easy in the other. That's kind of the, the heart of the idea of RSA encoding, which is great, practical, and fast, and, and we learned about that in Nicolas' talk if you happen to attend this talk. That's great. However, there's still reasons to be a little bit worried. One should not be paranoid here, but there is kind of a moment of hesitation maybe adequate in the sense that, well, it's not provably secure. It's not clear that factoring is a hard problem. Um, and to give a bit of more meat to that idea, I would like to remind you that prime testing, it's a, the small brother of factoring, it just asks, given a big number, that's, uh, is that a product of two primes or not? But you don't know which ones, what the factors are. You just want to know, is it or not? That used to be an NP problem, which t turned into a setting that can be solved with probabilistic algorithms that ultimately was de-randomized, so there's a, this is now a P problem that can be solved in polynomial time. So it made all the way from NP to P. What is more, the, the worst case complexity is hard, but it's not so well understood what the average case complexity is and where the hard instances are in that problem. I don't want to be paranoid, but there is reasons to believe that one should be a bit careful. Besides, it's a $1 million problem to show that P is not NP, but I mean, if you have an algorithm for factoring, I mean, there's better ways of getting a million dollars than just asking for the price because ultimately you can just go to any bank account and, and take the money anyway, right? So um, uh, <laughs> I don't want to be paranoid, but it's interesting to think about ideas beyond that. Then there's the obvious idea of taking a key and physically putting this guy into a suitcase and then hiring people in dark suits that would literally take that suitcase and move it to another place. You can do that. That's not so bad. In fact, it's also practically used in some instances. But there's an obvious security threat, which is, well, one, minute, one thing is you better pay your people better than the other side. Obvious security threat. A slightly less obvious one is this X-ray machine at the airport, is that an X-ray machine? Or is that a sophisticated machine that looks into the suitcase? Right? I mean, maybe now we're being a bit paranoid here, right? But ultimately, there's no way of checking whether somebody has intercepted the message and uh, has learned something about the key. You would not know. You would not find out. Right? It's bad. You say, oh, I have the key, but somebody has listened to it. That's not so good. You don't want that. And finally, there is quantum key distribution where you send single quantum systems through a channel like single photons or attenuated photons, like weak pulses through communication channels, and do that in a fashion so that one can make use of the fact that you can't learn, you cannot gain information about a quantum system without leaving a trace there, without disturbing it in a little bit in one way or the, the other. And this is a very clever and very deep idea, and the simplest scheme of that type is also the most practical, presumably, and also the most used and discussed one. It's a BB84 scheme going back to Bennett and Brassard's beautiful idea in 84, which basically sends orthogonal states in two non-orthogonal bases through a communication channel in conjunction with clever classical communication to make sure to establish a classical um, key. It's also easy to see that this is secure um, if there's no noise whatsoever, because then you, I mean, that's a, a quantum mechanics 101 exercise to see that you need to disturb and you kind of apply some sort of notion of Heisenberg's uncertainty to see that you have to mess up things when you intercept. But that's not so much the point of quantum key distribution. The, the point is that you can have a realistic quantum channel that adds noise and you can 
assert that the eavesdropper, the bad guy, takes that realistic quantum channel and replaces it by a very expensive super quantum channel that is much less not lossy and would make use of this extra information gain for some sophisticated type of eavesdropping. In fact, you can say that not only on one round, but on many invocations of that channel, you could learn about the state and even have a full, fully fledged quantum computer running and it would still be provably secure in this sense. You could even give unrealistic physical hardware to the eavesdropper and prove at least on the level of the protocol as such condition, uh, security based on the laws of, um, of physics. This is, I mean, that's on the laws of physics. Of course, if, you, if your passwords are all the same and the, the name of your dog or your daughter, I mean, this is a security risk in its own right, but I'm not talking about that, but about the implementation as, as such. So this is a picture from our friends at the BMBF, the Ministry for Research and Education, who talk, this, talk about bug-proof communication when they talk about quantum communication. Yeah, that's kind of cute, and um, they are supporting this very much, and one can, somewhat cynically speaking, take this almost as an evidence of how practical that is if the BMBF funds it. <laughs> I've not said this. Um, um, and, I mean, you've got to just learn from Nicola very nicely that this is close to commercial um, uh, realization. In fact, it is already commercially realized in that the spin-off of, of Nicola is selling products of this type and many other companies do that as well. So this is quantum key distribution. Let's move to quantum computation. So the idea that's not around the corner. Quantum key distribution is around the corner in the sense that we have to think what markets there are, what type of settings are reasonable, how to overcome the repeater problem, and so on, but this is a, a thing that's around the corner. Quantum computation is further ahead along the road. It's the idea of making a computational device made from single quantum systems. Like you have a, a string of ions or a string of atoms sitting there, and you compute them on the level of single atoms. So what is a computer? Well, a computer is a machine that computes, right? So you would have ultimately, if you break it down, you would have some sort of input that you can see as a, like a bit string in one way or the other. Then you compute again in one way or the other in the sense that you would do a, some sort of logical manipulation on the level of bits. And then you get an output, which means you measure the state and would get a bit string as the output. That's what a classical computer is ultimately about. Like as a, if I... Like a friend of mine is writing this book, Quantum Mechanics for Babies or so. That would be, um, he, he became quite rich with that. Um, so uh, it's like a computer for babies. It's a logical manipulation of bit strings. Now a quantum computer at the level of quantum computers for babies is a set of single quantum systems like qubits, seen as hyperfine levels, atoms. I mean, certain quantum degrees of freedom lined up. And that's not science fiction. There is architecture that have that property lined up where you do a computation which would now amount to a unitary transformation of the state of this entire system and a measurement at the end of the day. Okay, so this you can do or can think of, but in a similar way as you would not think of doing a logical state transformation on like very many bits in a classical computer that's completely unrealistic, it's broken down in gates, you would break this down in quantum gates which are small elementary building blocks, like small unitaries that act only on like one or two qubits at the same time, which are made and set up in a way that you would get approximately the right unitary of the overall computation. That's the setting you think of clever quantum gate circuits that set up the computation in a way, which would mean that you need a very controlled interaction between constituents at hand. So this is basically a quantum computer. In a way, again, quantum computers for, for, for babies, you replace the bits, the logical bit structure of our classical computers by a qubit structure, which means that you now have at your disposal the full Monty of the full Hilbert space, you meaning you can have an arbitrary superposition of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 plus beta 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 plus gamma 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, two to the power of n different basis vectors. Now, sometimes people say that that's cool because then you can kind of compute many things at the same time. There's this idea of quantum parallelism where you say that 
the quantum machine is just so clever that it can do exponentially many computations at the same time. This is not quite wrong, and it's not quite right. It's somewhere in the middle. Um, it's a bit missing the point, because ultimately, you are measuring, and all this beautiful superposition is, is gone. You get a classical outcome. The input is classical. The output is classical. Just in the middle, the magic appears. What is more, if the output is too entangled, you mess even things up. It, it doesn't work. Then things become too mixed. Basically, you have to get things very entangled along the way, and then disentangle them at the end to get a distribution that's very peaked to get a rather predictive outcome at the end of the day. Which means you have to be pretty clever in trading off structure and in using certain structure that a quantum computer is good at to get a quantum advantage in the first place and think of a good algorithm. There's many algorithms known, but it's not so easy to cook up good algorithms of, of a kind. But the cute thing is that quantum computers, once fully realized, could solve problems um, in polynomial time that are inconceivable on a classical computer in the sense that the runtime is too high. You see this BQP. These are the, the quantum computer solvable problems and the smaller subset of those guys that can be uh, solved in realistic time on a classical computer. And there's uh, problems outside that. So some delicate problems can be solved in polynomial time on a quantum computer that cannot be solved on a classical computer. I realize that this, these slides are a little bit down here, right? This is a kind of a one-dimensional room. Um, <laughs> okay, it is what it is, right? We have to live with it. Okay, good. Um, so here's the, the, the epicenter of algorithms, the holy grail of all algorithms that kind of made the field rocket off. It's the Shaw algorithm for hacking. We are in the middle of the session for code breaking, if you want, that solves factoring in polynomial time on a quantum computer. So I don't have the time to give a lecture on how Shor's algorithm works. I'll give you a hint at how that works. It's pretty ingenious, but it's a very clever guy also. You, it's, there's a classical component based on number theory and a quantum component. The classical component is basically the insight that a large number n can be found if the period p of the function a to the power of x mod n, where a is just some number that's not a factor, if it is, you can quickly check, done, um, can be identified. And a moment of thought reveals that this is the, the solution of a to the power of p minus 1 is 0 mod n, which means that you can split this off to a to the power of x over 2 minus 1. a to the power of x over 2 plus 1 is 0 mod n. And then you can see that with high probability, you do get a factor out if you have solved that problem. Sometimes not, but it's an NP problem. You can check whether you're right. If you're right, you say, ah, too bad. I do it again, 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 and then you will have it, and you will check the correctness of the outcome. So you have to find the period of a function, and that's what quantum computers are very good at, finding periods of functions. That comes from the, the Hilbert space structure, the wave structure, if you want. They're very good at finding out what a period is, like how the, the, the periodicity is of a function. That's done with a quantum Fourier transform. If that put, is put together, one can indeed show that this works and gives a solution to an AP problem in polynomial time on a quantum computer, whereas the best classical algorithm for the same problem has a runtime of e to the power of a sing, simple, a, 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 a similar expression. So it has an exponential improvement over the best known classical computer. And it would break codes of the type that Nicola has discussed. This is like one instance. It's a part of a large class of uh, cute algorithms called hidden subgroup problems with a large class of important um, algorithms. That's one algorithm. One can also solve linear problems exponentially better on a quantum computer than on a classical computer. And say, wait, this guy is, is cheating. Already solving a, a linear problem is classically pretty easy. Yeah, but. If you make a clever encoding of the input, you can do exponentially better on, on, on the quantum side. Spectral analysis, like a generalization of Fourier transform, Laplace transform, where you want to find the coefficients of damped sinoids, can again be done exponentially better on a classical computer. Semi-definite programming, like convex optimization, is another example of that type. These are some examples. They're nice examples. But it's very difficult to find good examples. So one has to work hard to think of new algorithms of a kind that make use of certain structure here of exponentiating structured matrices. If you want to know, know more about it, ask me. But it it's exploits structure in a heavy way to, to get going, to make it work. 
This is the perfect setting, but um, things are not perfect. Uh, the nice thing is, and then there's reasons to be worried because we've learned also from Nicola and from myself that if you have an imperfect machine, you cannot go into the lab or somebody else's lab and say, I check whether things are right. I mean, if you cook a meal, you can go into the kitchen and check is the meal right. If it's good, if the eggs are fine, you check, fine. You cannot do this with the corning computer. The moment you check, you say, oh dear, it's right, or it was right, but I've messed it up because I've learned about the, about the guy. Very bad. You cannot learn without changing the state. But you can overcome this. You cannot clone, right, but you can do something. You can extend in code words, and you can make measurements that would only learn what happened, what went wrong, but nothing about the logic information encoded. It's called quantum error correction, fault tolerance, and much of the effort of this field is finding good codes to make quantum computing possible in the presence of realistic errors in one kind or the other. And there's, of course, a very deep connection to condensed matter physics. Please ask me about it if you want to hear more about the connection to topological order and so on. So this is quantum computing in our head. That's fiction. But there's also a race for actually building these devices, in particular recently since a couple of companies have set out to build quantum computers, mostly based on superconducting devices. There is the efforts of Google, the ones of IBM. I was visiting IBM before Christmas, and I saw the 50-qubit superconducting qubit quantum device with my own eyes. It was just this kind of urban legend. It's not really fully announced yet, but this is a real, real existing machine. It's not yet a full quantum computer. It's not fault tolerant, it's not error correcting, but 50 qubits is not so bad. So there's a lot of impetus on actually realizing such devices, in particular recently um, with, um, addition, with new effort and impetus. Which brings me to the last point of my talk, because again, I'm between you and lunch. I don't want to um, stretch it, on quantum simulators. So what's a simulator? Well, it's simulating stuff, right? So what is a flight simulator? A flight simulator is saving Lufthansa from the awkward situation of having fresh pilots training their crash landings on brand new uh, A380s every day, which is a pretty costly endeavor. Instead, they put these guys into a flight simulator and let them check there. It's much cheaper. Right? A quantum simulator is something like that. You want to avoid high costs by doing something instead of doing the real thing. And what's the real thing? Well, you have to accept that most of research, a lot of research today is materials research. It's a big chunk of like, stuff on supercomputers being run is simulate materials complex quantum system on classical supercomputers. Now, not all strongly correlated quantum systems or materials can be classically simulated. There's powerful methods like DFT, tensor network methods, very cool ideas of identifying properties of matter in a very nice way, but there are some settings that you cannot address even with the cleverest and best supercomputers today as complex quantum systems for the same reason that Hilbert space is big. It's like in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy of space. Hilbert space is, is even bigger. I mean, it's a huge space, and you just can't put stuff on your computer and get things done, uh, done there. Now, this gentleman here had a beautiful idea some time ago in a beautiful talk or the lecture of a talk. Please read it. It's amazing. It's not just a throwaway remark, but he, the guy went through much of the idea in, in, single-handedly. Richard Feynman, for that matter, um, who just turned 100, or morally 100, um, of using other quantum systems to simulate quantum systems, but now under precisely controlled conditions. You go into the lab to simulate other quantum systems with precisely controlled conditions, like these guys here. Cold atoms and optical lattices are cases of that kind, where you would have like single atoms like eggs in an egg carton where standing wave laser light is the carton and the eggs are the atoms where single atoms are lined up in this fashion, but not one or two, but 10 to the power of five atoms lined up in a two-dimensional array, which you can control on the single atom level. It's a pretty exciting prescription of, of experimenting with 10 to the power of five single atoms in a way to do quantum simulation. One can simulate lots of interesting problems, like how do systems equilibrate, how do they pre-thermalize, thermalize, how does temperature come about in the first place in nature, because you, there's a kind of a hand and neck problem if you think about it. You want to see how 
to dynamically find how nature comes about through dynamical laws in one way or the other. It's an open question in physics to see how that happens and quantum simulations can give insight into how that works. Or how that doesn't work in many by the localization of systems that stubbornly don't thermalize and for awkward reasons don't like to do it. I'm saying that because there's a lot of interesting physics already happening that can be explored with these quantum simulators with existing quantum devices that you can't do otherwise, but you can do them on, 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 on the computer that gives rise to interesting physics um, going on. The last point I want to make, however, is that you can learn interesting physics about it. And I'm also a physicist, just like Nicola. I, I'm deeply interested in that. But the point of this, this talk is do stuff beyond classical supercomputers, right? You want to do something that you could not have done otherwise, even if you can afford runtime on the big supercomputers that we have available today. And the cute thing is that quantum simulators already have features of that kind as baby steps in, in, in that direction. So that's an example of that kind where you have a many-body system, like a 1D system, prepared initially in the setting of having no, no atom, an atom, nothing, atom, atom, nothing, atom, initially. And then you would look, look at the time evolution under a full, strongly correlated many-body Hamiltonian as a function of time monitored in time. And this, this picture here shows the data from a leading lab of this kind, actually here in Munich, that gives rise to this complex many-body dynamics in a sense. This plot not only shows that, but it also shows the result of a classical simulation on a supercomputer. In fact, not only that, but it was done on the best algorithm at the time for that problem, run on the fastest supercomputer the German taxpayer can afford, namely the Uli Supercomputing Center, and that's a relatively large um, economy. And um, it was run with five weeks of runtime on this guy, which is pretty much the upper limit of a publishable numerical result on a supercomputer. That works very nicely for short times, but not for long times, for quite deep reasons. Ask me about it. You cannot go to long times. But that generates the interesting situation that you can check interesting physics for long times, where for short times, you can check the correctness of the device. So in this sense, you are already, or we are already outperforming classical supercomputers with interesting physics quantum simulators in, in, in realistic labs. But then you say, cool, that's not a nice baby step. But you want to be sure that there's no lack of imagination. There could be a better algorithm doing it better with a smarter way. I mean, who are we? The best known algorithm, whatever. I mean, you know a better algorithm. Feel invited. So how can we be sure that you solve a problem that you could not have done on a computer in provably, that means you want to show this in terms of computational complexity. Interestingly, that's the last point I'm making to keep some time for discussion. So here's the, the point that you, the approximation with the best known method is exponential in time, but you could, could do better. There are specific settings that are not so outwardly that one can do with realistic experiments of preparing product states you look at time evolution under a nearest neighbor easy Hamiltonian for one unit of time, like short times, and you would do sampling of the outcomes like single site measurements at the end of the day. This is not a very super exciting quantum simulation. You, you get random numbers. They look pretty awkward and very stupidly random. However, they are so structured that you can show using an argument that I will only say something about if you ask me about it, that produce random numbers that are so delicate that you can't resample them on a classical computer. The tails are funny that there's no way you can, it's a stupid machine, but there's no way you can compute, uh, program a classical computer to do the same thing. That's not the first prescription of that kind. But the known ones of that kind had the property that you can do it, but you cannot distinguish the outcome of that from a machine that you could have done classically as well. That was a bit of funny. What I mean is, Think I claim I have a supercar. I say, I have a supercar. It's probably better than a car. And then you look at it and say, oh, that looks like a Fiat Ponto. I mean, nothing against Fiat. It's a great car. But they say, yeah, but it's a supercar. I can prove it. Then you, you look at it. OK, you drive it. Say, oh, but it, it accelerates like a Fiat Ponto. Yeah, but see. And then you go to the motorway, left lane. Do, 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 do. Say, what? I mean, at 100 kilometers per hour, it's like going funny. It's like, what is this? It's like a Fiat Ponto. No, 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 it's a supercar. You brake, it feels like a Fiat Ponto in all operational respects. But it's provably better. It's interesting, but there's a bit of a tension here, so to say, right? Um, 
but it's mathematically perfectly compatible. But these schemes have the nice feature that you can do it, but it has the additional feature that you can check whether it has been right. You can take measurements, efficient measurements, and if the red light goes on, you say, oh, I'm too noisy, I cannot do it. But if the green light goes on, it is approved, and you have done the right measurement, and you have done the right quantum simulation, and you've done it. You say, oh, great, then I can predict the outcome. But you can't. You have to go into the lab. You have to do the experiment. You have to do it, but you can check the correctness of something you cannot predict the outcome for. That's, again, also philosophically cool. You do something. You cannot predict what comes out, but I can say it's right. You say, yeah, but, but what is it? No, it's right. It's kind of a thing. But it's just, I, can, I can say more about this if you want to know. Go, OK, let's, I'm nice in time, 40 minutes. So that leaves me time, so let's just basically wrap up. We've learned something about quantum technologies. It's an exciting field. It's young, but not that young. I'm also young, but not that young. <laughs> um, no, <laughs> uh, no, seriously, um, this field has obtained much impetus also recently because people got quite serious about it, not the least because private companies got serious about it to, and set out to actually build quantum devices, quantum computers in their respective labs. The funders like the Australian government, the Chinese government, and our friends at the European Commission are now dedicated to this, and they've installed, installed like a 1 billion euro flagship initiative for quantum technologies like sensing, simulation, computation, and quantum key distribution that Nicola has spoken about that gives the field a fresh impetus and fresh creativity um, going on. A bit of a, a refreshed interest in, 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 the, in the field, mostly for good reasons. I would, I would say. In fact, sometimes it's even a bit too much in the sense that I took this picture here from a similar event where they show the Gartner hype cycle for emerging technologies um, where you have the initial enthusiasm and a bit of a, of a meltdown and a kind of stable recovery after that. And you see like machine learning is, is just there according to their assessment. Quantum computing is somewhere there. That's good. Um, so there's a lot of excitement in the field. but. One has to be a realistic tool. Like twice a month, I get a phone call by some bank saying, "Can you do? Sh should I do trading with quantum machine learning?" Say, well, classical machine learning is pretty good too. <laughs> um, so it's an exciting field, but one has to re be realistic about it. So uh, I like to cite a friend of mine who said, in this context, "Oh, that after all, quantum computing." It's exciting, even if you restrict yourself to saying things that are true. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. OK, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, we have time for some questions before lunch. <coughs> That's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. You gave nicely insights into the different applications. Can you yeah. say something about quantum sensing? Ah, um, sure. Um, OK, I mean, quantum sensing is unsurprising about sensing, right? It's about like frequency standards, like measuring, like certain kinds of measuring in a certain uh, like accurate fashion where the sensitivity is overcoming certain limitations that arise from any prescription that you can do within quantum mechanics for single quantum systems. But if you are clever and use quantum systems in many ways and use like entangled states of many quantum systems, you can overcome the sensitivity that you would have, for example, when you do frequency standards, if you like entangle many ions in a certain clever fashion, then you can overcome limits that you would have if you didn't use entanglement. The, the field means use entanglement in a clever fashion to overcome limits for sensing and uh, metrology applications. It's a, the, that's the short answer. The long answer is delicate. There was a bit of a enthusiasm that you can do lots of things. And people realized, oh, but with noise, it's a bit less interesting. And then a third enthusiasm was that, yeah, but if you do it cleverly, you can do interesting things. That's the short answer. The medium answer. 
Hello. Um, it's been suggested that the human brain is a, a, a quantum computer, and this, uh, which is entangled with the experiment and causes the thing to, to collapse or whatever. Can you uh, comment on that? Do you uh, believe that, or is that just uh, superstition? Well, um, that's a difficult question. I mean, maybe your brain is. <laughs> I think mine isn't. I hate to break it. Um, yeah, well, I mean, my offline answer, the camera is off, is I think no. I mean, I think there's, it's a very interesting endeavor. I mean, both practically and um, intellectually to think about this, and it's very important. And ultimately, it's a question that can be decided by empirics. I mean, we will be able to see whether there is long-range entanglement in synapses, and we should, know, we should check it. And there's a field like quantum biology that basically asks questions of that type, but slightly more modest questions, like is photosynthesis quantum? Is that entangled over large distances? Do quantum effects help to make things coherent? And is a bit of noise, a bit of coherence nice in the right fashion? Why not the brain? However, one should be a little bit cautious that the entire brain is a quantum computer. And besides, to be a quantum computer, it means that the entire brain is entangled. If you have like small parts that are quantum entangled, that means nothing. That's just a new building block that's, again, classical on a, lot, on a coarse grain scale. You have, would have full entanglement over the full brain. That is a possibility. I mean, there are kind of decoherent studies that are rather pessimistic, I would say. And there is kind of the scientific, now I'm a bit, a bit evil, um, one should be a bit careful of the fallacy of pushing stuff into dark corners. I mean, like there was the idea that consciousness has to do with collapse or with, with uncomputability, and then people realized, wait a minute, the, the, the question of computability is the same on quantum computers that, that like on classical computers. Ah, but then the brain is a quantum gravitational computer. And then you say, oh, but how would I know? I don't, we don't have a theory of quantum gravity. See, I told you, right? I mean, it's a bit like, I mean, I don't want to be negative about it, but there is a bit of a, is the camera actually on? Maybe it is. Um, there's a bit of a, I mean, one should stay away at least from the situation of pushing things in corners where the science is a bit shaky and say this is where, where the interesting stuff happens. Because quantum phase is so interesting and long-range entanglement persists in many settings. Maybe not in the brain. But maybe, I mean, it's interesting. I'm skeptical, but I invite Nicola to make tests. I mean, in the end, it's an empirical question. We should make experiments about it. Okay, we have time for the last question. Okay. <clears throat> so beyond the applications and quantum simulation that you yep. were showing, um, do you see applications of like um, these smaller scale, very noisy devices that are currently being built by the companies where um, these kind of quantum computers could have some sort of supremacy over um, classical computers? Um, that's an interesting question. And in, let's face it, it's the key question. And that's surprisingly difficult in the sense that there is not so many good applications for small-scale devices that are not fully error-correcting. Maybe a bit, maybe approximate error correction, but not fully fledged. It's not so obvious. Like I was twice invited to major conferences with precisely that talk title, th that conference title with everybody trying very hard, and in the end you said, yeah, we have to work harder. I mean, there's a couple, like tensor network contraction is a good example. That's something you could do on a small scale quantum computer. What the IBM people are doing, that's also cute, is you do like quantum chemistry simulations on quantum machines, but not the full-fledged thing, like where you do have a second quantized Hamiltonian with quartic fermionic terms, and you trotterize them and do a fully-fledged fault tolerant quantum computer with runtimes over months to simulate like um, fertilizer quantum chemistry problems, but rather think of very small scale devices that would just be variational principles over small scale quantum chemistry problems like finding the best distance in dimers or so. And there is quantum classical hybrids where you make a classical algorithm, you have a quantum part and you learn something, you feed it back to a variational principle and you, you run it, which seems to provide reasonable reasonably good answers. It's not so clear what the, um, what the advantage is, but that's something I'm also very personally interested in. Annealers, people were very skeptical about quantum annealers, like D-Wave, and were extremely arrogant about it, which was partially due to the clash of civilizations between the uh, commercial world and the academic world. They spoke not the, the right language, and the, the, the commercial people made very loud claims, which the academics didn't like. It was a mismatch, and they got completely trashed. 
but for not but it, 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 a bit unfairly so. It's, it's more interesting than you, than you think, and there could be potential in approximating optimization problems with annealers that, at least in the way of constant uh, advantages or in approximation problems, overcome and outperform classical computers for the same problem. So there is lots of space, but this is where what we need to do. That's our job for theorists to, to solve that. This is the, you're at the heart of the matter. Okay, I think time is up because now it's basically lunch because it's a lunch. second lunch. Okay. So maybe you can take the question later. Thank you for the interest. Thanks for the interest. Again.